All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbeen.com. We have a stellar guest today, Some somebody we have been talking about for a few days now, actually a few weeks. Uh, Dr. Bartlett, we have been talking about your protocol, about your uh, discussions about the budesonide, and we have you have been a present uh, guest for us or an absent guest for us in many of our talks. So I'm going to quickly introduce you, and then we'll we'll start our discussion. So uh, for the cool beans here, for our viewers, Dr. Bartlett has been in general practice and emergency care for about 28 years. His excellence in general medicine got uh, Governor Rick Perry's attention. He brought him up with the uh, Texas Health Disparities Task Force. Over there, he has been, he served for seven years, although normal uh, tenure is two years, but he was extended so many times because of his excellence in work. Uh, then Dr. Bartlett's peers in West Texas elected him to serve as the Ector County Medical Society president for four consecutive terms. Dr. Bartlett served for over 20 years with the local CBS medical expert for the uh, Permian Basin. Currently, Dr. Bartlett hosts a local weekly radio program on KCRS 550 AM discussing COVID-19. So it would actually be fun if you can actually join him on that as well. Uh, and then I have a, a website as well that I'll show you for Dr. Bartlett that is the COVID-19 uh, silver uh, bullet. So I'm gonna show that site as well. Dr. Bartlett, uh, welcome. Thank you, I'm honored to be with you in the cool beans. Thank you very much. We have been anticipating your um, presence here for some time, so thank you very much for your time. So uh, let's get into the discussion the most important thing, the, the thing that has made you very popular here, I'm sure that you were popular before as well, is that your use of nebulization. So can I please uh, have number one, your introduction, if you wanted to say some more, and then what is this protocol that you uh, have been using? And then we'll go into some questions about that as well. Sure, well, let's, let's take it from the top. Uh, yeah. Back in March, I was working a 48 hour shift in the ER. And if you'll remember at that time, all of us worldwide were watching the disaster that unfolded in China. And then we watched it slowly creep across the continent of Europe with Italy being hit and uh, watching and uh, looking for any information that would come out. I'm sure you were right there with me and saw that 48 percent of the healthcare workers in North Italy eventually were testing positive. Uh, they were taking care of COVID when they were wearing universal precautions. Yes. Uh, and so they were in universal precautions and still 40% were testing positive. And so that begs the question, how much is a mask going to help if they were in universal precautions? And so all these thoughts were popping in my head. We were told that there was a potential treatment strategy of hydroxychloroquine and zinc uh, and, and uh, ZPAC. And so I re researched that. And I was thinking, what am I going to do if someone comes in the emergency room, like all of us were back in March? There was nothing that was offered to us but the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and, uh, and ventilators. We were told we're not going to have enough ventilators. Uh, that was what my focus was, because that's where we were led in January, February and March to think that it would be late term care that could be offered only. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, if you'll remember the the. Uh, the messaging to all of us physicians who were caring about our patients that were coming in the emergency room in distress was late care. Um, if they had mild to moderate symptoms, they shouldn't even be coming to the emergency room. And uh, testing was not very readily available back in March. And so uh, this strategy, uh, first and foremost, my strategy was a stopgap measure looking for a way to help people because we were told ventilators. We were told that it's a respiratory infection that does cause a cytokine storm, but we were hearing about the uh, focus from the top with the World Health Organization and the CDC was respiratory distress, remember that. And so I was looking for a stopgap measure that would address that when people could not breathe. And of course, in the emergency room or in any uh, medical setting, we're looking at ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. Those are fundamental in ACLS, advanced trauma life support. I'm an instructor of ATLS. And so uh, those are paramount, ABCs. You don't, you don't go past that till you, till you secured it. Stabilize the patient. 
And so with that in mind, um, a medicine that had been around for 25 years, generic, I'd been, I had a long history of using it because asthma is everywhere. 25 million Americans have asthma right now. And uh, that means millions of Americans are using budesonide right now that are healthy in a preventive uh, strategy. The first line strategy for preventing asthma attacks is an inhaled steroid. And we don't think about the potential risk with inhaled budesonide of cataracts, I mean, of glaucoma, of all the other potential risks with an inhaled steroid because of the uh, low systemic load that you'll get from an inhaled steroid in general. It does, the, the systemic effect of an inhaled budesonide is very little compared to taking uh, oral steroids or, uh, you know, parenteral steroids. And so we use those all the time in the ER when it's needed to save a life, to stabilize a patient. But I, I thought the least risk, uh, least risk of side effect with the, with the potential gain would be an inhaled steroid. And I was shocked when I started to use this strategy. I, I really did not know that it would work so well. Uh, and so I stumbled upon something like someone seeing that, well, the bacteria is not growing around that penicillin, penicillium uh, fungus. Uh, that's interesting. It's observable. It's reproducible. And so I found uh, something that was observable, reproducible. That is how we, di how we define a scientific fact. And uh, I was starting to have some of the most at-risk patients from the start. I uh, had a lady who, a grandmother, who uh, calls me on a Friday because she had been hearing me talk about these uh, uh, updates on uh, after I'd uncovered the budesonide and started talking about it. And she, for five days, was flat on her back at home in the in bed. She has two forms of lymphoma right now, still, and she had received radiation therapy a month before. And she was on chemotherapy at the time. And the oncologist told her correctly, whatever you do, do not get COVID. That would be a disaster. So for five days, she has a nonstop fever that won't break. She can't sleep. Uh, she's fatigued. The, 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 the extreme fatigue that's associated with this disease is, is, is noteworthy uh, compared to other diseases that where people have fever and chills and they're, not, they're knocked down for a day or two. But this disease is unique. And so she was flat on her back, a nonstop fever, reaches out to me on a Friday night. I order the budesonide as a nebulizer treatment, and her fever breaks that night with the first treatment. And she's able to get relief from the breathing, the shortness of breath, and the chest tightness mm -hmm. with the first treatment, she says. Over that weekend, on Monday morning, she's feeling well enough to work an eight-hour day via Zoom teaching her uh, eight hour day, teaching her students music lessons. And, wow. and you know, she becomes symptom free a, a week later uh, and she gets two consecutive negatives, independent of budesonide. I'm not saying budesonide cures. I'm saying that she was cured because she had the definition of a cure, which is uh, symptom free with two consecutive negatives. Budesonide was, was used as a stopgap measure trying to help her breathe. But it just it. coincidentally seemed to help her breathe and she just had a side effect of recovering. I love this, I love this. So one thing that I wanted to discuss with our uh, viewers here, uh, we have been talking about this for some time as well, that it seems like in the early parts, the intervention is not really there. It's just stay at home, take care of yourself symptomatically but it seems like that was the right time to attack the disease and to stall it from progressing further. May that be hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin or budesonide. And one anecdote I wanna add to the budesonide discussion over here, in a different country where now the ICUs are empty and the hospital corona units are shutting down and the population is 220 million people, one major difference in treatment from other countries is that they've been using steroids early. So I am so appreciative of your thinking or, and your eagerness, your keenness to make sure that the patient that you're serving, there is, as you're saying, stopgap measure, there is something that has to be done to make sure that they are, uh, they are treated in the early part. So tell me this, uh, uh, Dr. Bartlett, 
this is something that we've been talking for a long time. In terms of staging, we look at the, the COVID-19 as there are some people who are asymptomatic. So fine, we do not know and they do not know that they have the issue. Then mildly symptomatic, then moderate, then severe, critical, and then nowadays long haulers as well. Your experience of using budesonide is that at some specific stage, how early have you used it? So my focus initially was stabilizing the patient. As an ER doctor, my goal was to make sure I had a strategy that I could employ to stabilize my patients in the emergency room. But also I am uh, doing occupational medicine and primary care for a large company uh, in West Texas. And so we started having patients, uh, uh, quite a few patients with uh, COVID. And so my focus was early treatment. But I got an email uh, about a month into this from a hospital south of San Antonio, doctor, and it shocked me. And it wasn't my thought. They, did, hmm. they had come across my treatment protocol hmm. and uh, had seen a video of an interview that I had done. And they got their staff together and they unanimously decided they would try to employ this on their COVID patients in the ICU late hmm. here. And they emptied the ICU in 48 hours, sir. And I was shocked. And they told me since they've been using this strategy and it emptied the ICU, everybody recovered and went home in 48 hours. Uh, yeah. they had, yes. Uh, hmm. They said prior to doing that, they were having to intubate 50% of the patients that came in their ICU with COVID and transfer them for long-term ICU care in San Antonio. And mm -hmm. since they've used that about a month and a half ago, they their ICU is still empty because mm -hmm. they're now employing it in their community in early treatment. They're they're using uh, they're not just going by testing. They're using common sense, mm -hmm. tried and true, evidence based. Historically, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it might be a duck. And so because there's this pandemic that's wiping out uh, huge populations, they're being proactive with a strategy that, that all the medicines are uh, category B for pregnant people. They're all very safe. If you look at their uh, safety profiles, the risk to benefit ratio, considering you're treating people who have a, uh, a potentially life-threatening pandemic, uh, they're they're using it early. Think looking at simple symptomatology, and their hospital is almost empty as well of COVID patients. This and, is beautiful. Yes, and this so and so, I, I your question is correct. I was focused on uh, the strategy of early care and stabilizing my patient in the ER, but others have taken it a step farther than me, and they deserve credit for that. They have employed it at every stage. And we have a case here in, in Midland, Texas, where I, 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 I practice in Midland, Texas. And uh, the hospital was very resistant because, as everyone knows, there's no FDA-approved medication for COVID. Understood. But if I have a patient that has an airway problem or a breathing problem or a circulation problem, I'm going to make sure I take care of their airway and then their breathing and their circulation. And with COVID, Many people have 50 percent have uh, diarrhea and can get dehydrated. So although it's not FDA approved for COVID, quote unquote, I'm probably going to give them IV fluids and I'm going to help them recover and, with their circulation. But if they have respiratory problem, breathing problems, I'm going to address that as well with something else that's not FDA approved for COVID. Amazingly, they do better. And so here in Midland, Texas, the hospital that was very resistant to doing that had met with the family and said, uh, there's nothing we have. Uh, they spent 30 minutes talking to the family. This was just a week ago and hmm. said, he's been on the ventilator for three weeks. He's 62 years old. Uh, he, um, there's nothing else we can do. We've given him the room disappear. We've given him the plasma. We've done everything. Hmm. You have three choices. Now one is hospice. One, hmm. we can extubate him and, and, and let him go, mm. or we can do a tracheotomy mm. and see if he can fight it off on his own. And the family pushed back and said, have you tried the budesonide? And they said, no, we don't do that here. And mm. they, the family was very insistent and very persuasive. 
had to raise their voice apparently. Hmm. And so the, the, the doctor backed off and started using it. He's getting better. Excellent. And, and he's been in the ICU for three weeks. So wow. he's got that, he's got the effect of the high peak that hmm. he's on. He's had some pneumothoraxes apparently. He's had a lot of problems before he got the budesonide. So mm. that, that residual effect had, mm. is still there, but the budesonide is lowering his uh, PEEP his, uh, and it's lowering uh, the uh, the oxygen percent oxygen that he's requiring in the ICU on the vent right now. So he's recovering. Amazingly, doctors are finding that an anti-inflammatory uh, will help an inflammatory disease called COVID. And uh, I think in time, that's going to, the cat's out of the bag. People have taken this farther than me and they deserve credit for saving their patients' lives. But uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. So I wanted to, once again, uh, me being a doctor and have been discussing things with our cool beans for about four months now, I keep adding some comments in here as well. Look, uh, for the cool beans here who are listening, this is the definition of a doctor. The definition of a doctor is not just that Let's look for the algorithms from FDA or from some other authority and whatever. Yes, I understand it is necessary to look at those algorithms so that your insurance and your liabilities and those things are covered. But COVID-19 is an exceptional case. It did not come with a brochure or with a document to say, treat me this way. And FDA did not know, all of us did not know what to do about it. And this is where the medical training comes in. This is where the doctor steps in and says, okay, this is what I'm seeing. Just like Dr. Bartlett just talked about it, that if there is inflammation, I'm going to treat inflammation. If there is some something with the circulation, I'm going to treat circulation issues. So that is the definition of the medicine that should be practiced by a doctor. I really, really admire the work that you've done. And I also admire the people who took the courage to start using it a little earlier to see. And, and I wanted to uh, talk about this study as well. On the WHO site, I actually read that study as well. I talked about it in, in one of our discussions too, that the uh, steroid use early on was contraindicated because it could cause harm. And here we are with a different evidence in front of us. So oh, do you, okay. you want to address this? Yes, you're, you're spot on, sir. And uh, you've been observing uh, that in January we were told absolutely contraindicated to use a corticosteroid against COVID. And then Oxford University has the audacity to give people in the ICU on the ventilator dexamethasone. Um, and uh, they have a third better mortality uh, rate. Uh, there, in other words, people that would have died don't die. And uh, that was groundbreaking. It, it showed that uh, what we were told was upside down and backwards from the beginning. Uh, we were told late care only. Basically, uh, they said if you have early, or mild to moderate symptoms, stay home. And what we've seen across the country using what we've been told as doctors from the CDC and the World Health Organization, they should know. And so we assume that they do know uh, that we shouldn't uh, intervene if they have mild to moderate symptoms. Well, this is the first disease that we have ever used that strategy. And actually that, does, that strategy um, there's, when you look at the, what, who the World Health Organization is quoting for that strategy, a whole lot of it came out of China. And so the World Health Organization was praising uh, the results that they were getting in China. And I was horrified with what I was seeing on YouTube and in the news about what was happening in China. People were literally walking down the streets and fall, collapsing, falling on their face forward in the streets. The streets were bare. Um, the ICUs were full of people. And, and so um, I, you got to consider the source and um, every doctor, for instance, if, if you or me or anyone was on a highway and I've been in this situation where uh, someone is hit by a truck on the highway, I've had two patients I've had to treat on the side of the road that were hit by vehicles at mm -hmm. high speed. And I've had to use whatever I have available. And so if I had to take my belt off and put it around their leg as a tourniquet, even though that belt is not FDA approved for as a tourniquet to stop uh, someone from hemorrhaging to death from their femoral artery tear, so what? Let's just take care of the patient 
Let's use common sense. We have training for a reason. We do continuing education often because we want to do the best care we can. And I appreciate what you do with the cool beans, uh, continuing to talk about cutting edge strategies. But COVID, man, we've never had this monster before. Um, and as far as corticosteroids, this, uh, I was shocked when I had been treating with budesonide for a month. And of course that, you know, you're kind of intimidated because we're, I'm the only one that's using it in March. And I was like, if I talk about this, am I going to lose my license? What are they going to do with me? And, but when I saw that France was going to start a study with inhaled budesonide against COVID, I thought, this is, this is my time. I have to share this. It works. They don't need to wait for the study. But France is studying inhaled budesonide against COVID. Spain is scheduled to study inhaled budesonide against COVID. France also studied budesonide eye drops for COVID. Did you know that? Oh, wow. No, I did not know that. And it worked. And so uh, we know, uh, we've been told that uh, it can come in through the conjunctiva, through the air, upper airway. And so actually there was a study uh, a couple months ago, I remember hearing about mouthwash being a, 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 a strategy. And actually that's actually being studied in, and used in Japan and is being studied in UK right now because, you know, this is a, a groundbreaking thought for me, but it doesn't come straight from the atmosphere into the lungs. It has to come through the upper airway to get into the lower upper uh, to the lower airway. Correct. I had, I had the privilege the other day of talking to Dr. Zelenko, who was the, who was the father of the strategy of using hydroxychloroquine to get the zinc into the cells and um, as and as an anti-inflammatory as well. And so uh, he had this profound insight that he was telling me while we were having a Zoom meeting for an hour, that for five days, it seems to be the, uh, the pattern, disease, the disease process is five days of an upper airway congestion and sore throat, and then it moves down. And so I have been telling my patients to use mouthwash, to swish and gargle mouthwash uh, as often as they're willing to, because we know that it doesn't just stay in the lungs. Uh, the symptoms are not just going to be in the lungs. They're going to continue to have a sore throat congestion. And so there's some common sense things that um, are at our fingertips already. But inhaled budesonide has been a game changer for, uh, for many of my patients. I've been shocked. I think that this is a game changer for the whole COVID-19 management protocol. And, and for the cool beans, I'm going to share Dr. Bartlett's protocol in a second. I have it here up as well. I'll share my screen. But uh, if I dare say, so we all become very careful when we say these things. But if I dare say that instead of all those exotic remdesivirs and favipiravirs and, and lironlimabs, and, and again, I'm not against any of these drugs, right. but steroids, possibly hydroxychloroquine, possibly ivermectin, these are cheap and effective treatments if started right in the beginning. I was not, I was very careful. I'm even today, uh, my uh, cool bean community knows, I always say that I'm shy to say steroid use early on. Maybe uh, we shouldn't do it. But wherever I have asked, you are here, Dr. Bart Bartlett, wherever I have asked, I have tons of my class fellows who are practicing. I have a lots of people who are working with me, uh, providing me their uh, evidences, majority of them now in general practice have shifted towards steroid use. Yes, sir. And I have the same reservations. I don't want to cause someone with diabetes to have their sugar go out of control. I don't want to decrease their bone density. I don't want to decrease their muscle mass. I don't want to cause anxiety and insomnia. But when you're talking about um, systemic steroids, those are the potentials. But what I have found is when you're using inhaled budesonide, which had, when it first came out as Pomacort, the brand name Pomacort, they studied it in the NICU in Abilene, Texas before, which is in my neighborhood. Everything's, you know, far in Texas, but that's pretty close. And so I knew that they were using it on two pound preemie babies at that stage. That's pretty delicate humans. And we use it in, in the nursing homes on the fragile elderly. We don't blink, we don't bat an eye. 
we know that we have second graders that are using nebulizer treatments every day at home uh, that are healthy people. We're not worried about making them sick and turning and increasing their chance of a secondary bacterial infection, which doctor, I want to mention, uh, there are two, uh, when I started researching this, uh, there were two inhaled steroids that, uh, that I noticed that were studied side by side. Uh, and one had a potential risk of increasing secondary bacterial pneumonia risk three times. And that was not budesonide. Budesonide did not have that risk. And so I was wow. thrilled to see that because, I, you know, I have that concern. We don't want to turn down the immune system, but you're not, you're not giving it as a systemic steroid. You're giving it very targeted. So I was a medical technologist before I was a doctor. And so I understand uh, all, all, a lot of these things. I took immunology, one, two, three, four, and a lot of serology and a lot of things before I ever went to medical school. And we all know the risk of steroids. We don't want to use steroids if we don't have to. Correct. But, uh, but uh, in this case, we're talking about a pandemic that was wiping pe communities out. Correct. And 50% of, of the people that are dying are nursing home uh people and we saw what happened in new york with that disaster where yeah. the governor sent it sounds like over four thousand people that, uh, that were severely sick into nursing homes and then we have over thirty thousand people that have died at least um there and counting uh, and so we need to employ some common sense strategies hmm. that are already at our disposal and uh so i have not found that this increases the risk of secondary bacterial pneumonia mm. and the research was done before me that it doesn't increase that risk three times like another steroid which i don't want to mention you uh, you're, you're, the cool beans are brilliant people and they do research so they'll find it absolutely so i'm going to do a couple of things one there is a comment here so while i, I want to share your uh, site and your protocol I wanted to talk about this one comment here, which uh, seems to be repeatedly there, that we should give IV uh, steroids. I want to uh, stress one thing that the protocol that Dr. Bartlett has been using and has been uh, talking about, this is inhaled because it keeps the steroids as much as on the lung side and not in the system. So uh, give me one quick second, uh, Dr. Bartlett, if you if you will, I want to show your site to, to the cool beans here. So guys, this is Dr. Bartlett's site. If you go here uh, and if you scroll this page down, there is this case study and the full protocol over here. And I have them open separately as well. I actually went over the case studies and highlighted some parts of these as well. Um, again, the main question that I had for Dr. Bartlett was, can it be used earlier? And so we all heard the response to that as well. And then there is one more thing that I would love if uh, Cool Beans can actually go and read it. That is, if you go to the bottom of this page, and again, uh, Dr. Bartlett, you and Alexandria Watkins work. This is amazing. I love it. Over here, you have actually addressed one more thing, and I'm going to ask you this question, and that is about the nebulization causing the vapors and spreading the virus itself, because that is another common discussion that I've heard that hey, if you nebulize, if you use a nebulize, there will be vapor created and that would cause the virus to further uh, spread. So I want to have that discussion here. So nebulizer and concerns of SARS-CoV-2 transmission. But before we go there, I also wanted to show that there is one more PDF on Dr. Bartlett's uh, page that I just showed you. Link is in the description. And that is where he has his uh, protocol as well. And that protocol is what I'm scrolling here right now. So if I go back to Dr. Bartlett for a second, uh, so how about nebulization and the risk of the um, the vapor and spread? Well, that, that's a valid concern. And so uh, we addressed that in the paper and we, we, we uh, cite articles that show there might be risk, uh, slight increased risk. And then there's also some uh, articles that we found uh, of research showing that there is no risk. And so it's equivocal. But I'll tell you what we have found, that the greatest risk to the hospital staff and patients that have not been infected yet with aerosols, aerosolization of the SARS-2 virus from a patient, the one procedure that is absolutely the most risky is intubation and extubation. And what is happening 
with COVID patients that we're seeing in the news every day. They're all put on a ventilator. They have to be intubated first and they have to be extubated if they're fortunate enough to come home. And so the intubation is the greatest risk of aerosolization. But are we hold, withholding that when it could be life-saving? And so always with every procedure, we need to talk about risk and benefit. But of course, we all know that every hospital has to have negative pressure isolation rooms. And so if you have that concern, that's what that is for. And also now um, the hospitals that are employing this are not finding that it's spreading. And so there are ICUs with people on ventilators that they are giving this to through while they're intubated and they're getting the treatment and no one else is getting sick with COVID. And so uh, we're having now not just historical evidence or having to read journal articles, which takes six months for an article many times to be in a, published in a journal. And this disease, let's just be realistic, since January, seven months, right? Seven, eight months. We haven't had a lot of time for, uh, for this particular, but I, in, my, in my article that we wrote, we have cited uh, weak evidence that it might uh, be a potential risk of aerosolization. And we found articles that actually say there is no risk. Personally, I have found that uh, nobody, uh, there has not been a downside to this. And the reason I'm using nebulization uh, is probably obvious to every cool beans because all the cool beans are brilliant. And that is that if you use an inhaler, um, some studies show based on uh, the person that's using it, that 90% of the medicine will never get to where you need it. And certainly, Let's talk about someone who's in respiratory distress, short of breath, can't take a deep breath. Uh, and that's the person trying to do it, even with the spacer. The nebulizer is a game changer as far as giving a, uh, an effective dose right where you need it. Of course, the, the SARS-2 virus is attached to the endothelium, to the ACE receptors. It's, it, uh, a lot of it is topical. Uh, in the lung tissue. And so you're getting it right to the culprit. And it is amazing how it shuts it down. I love it. I love it. And this is actually a very, very important thing. I'll keep repeating this, that instead of getting the patient to a state where they need to go to a hospital and now they are on a ventilator or oxygen and they, the, the, the threat to the life is a lot, if we can take care of the things early on, it is great. And what I'm hearing is that steroids and what I've he heard from other doctors as well, steroids even use when we say that the disease stage is viral. That is when the virus itself is replicating. Even then, steroids are helpful. So uh, tell us one more thing here, uh, Dr. Bartlett. Uh, what is the basic function of the steroid? We've discussed that before as well. You have also talked about that in your PDF to your paper. Uh, how do steroids help in these situations? Well, specifically, uh, and so we have that information in the, in, the, in the article that we wrote, the case study. And I only put two patient uh, cases in that because I wanted to uh, highlight some salient points in their, in their uh, illness, in their disease course uh, that seemed to be very significant. Uh, but um, the steroids do several things. And the studies have been done for the last 20 years with budesonide. Budesonide does decrease the viral load. It also down regulates the ACE receptors. It actually pulls away the welcome mat. Over time, uh, there's less ACE receptors because of the inhaled budesonide. And so that's really significant because if you'll think about why are we not seeing children spread this disease like adults are? And why are they not having severe illnesses? And, and the, uh, the theory has been that they have less ACE2 receptors than adults. And so that might be uh, also part of the recovery. So it, it down regulates the ACE receptors over time. It decreases the viral load and COVID uh, is an inflammatory disease. And so we there is uh, research that have already been done by brilliant people that I, uh, that I uncovered and that everyone can find and we've, we've uh, cited 51 um, references in, in, in the article, but uh, interleukin 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 11, 13, 15, uh, SCF, GMCSF, and then thromboxane. Thromboxane is released from the lung tissue 
and increases the uh, the uh, hypercoagulable state, which is causing PEs and uh, clotting in the coronaries, clotting in the cerebral arteries, um, DVTs. Uh, and so we have increased um, cyclooxygenase. All of those things are suppressed from being released by inhaled budesonide. Research has already been there that proves that. And so you're actually, uh, it's a perfect overlay of all the potential dangerous chemicals, the cytokines and the inflammatory enzymes like cyclooxygenase. You, you think about how effective ibuprofen is um, or uh, how, how, how many of us have prescribed Mobic or Relafin. Um, those, those have a profound effect at times, but that's just one out of uh, dozens of inflammatory chemicals that are poured into the body starting in the lung tissue. And so if you use, uh, my experience has been and, uh, that it totally suppresses uh, the release of those is the only explanation that you have for the cytokine storm not progressing. Um, and uh, I have not had one patient go, you know, multi-organ failure is the end game uh, uh, in January, February, and March. But none of my patients have had renal failure. None of my patients have had any end organ failure. Uh, even ARDS, if they're started on this and, and you're using it aggressively. Here's something that I'm going to share with your viewers that ha I have not been able to uh, broadcast far and wide yet. But just like we use a Medrol dose pack and we start with an, a, a large dose and that turns it and then we have to taper the dose, that kind of strategy with the inhaled budesonide has been a game changer for me. And I stumbled upon it just like we would with any new disease. Um, a patient just radically improved when he did his dosing earlier than I told him. And I was horrified. I thought, oh, no, I hope he doesn't blow up. They, they took the medicine sooner than I had recommended. And instead, it, it only brought uh, a, a quicker recovery. And so I have found that escalating the steroid dose in a targeted manner that does not cause a systemic load that would have all those potential side effects that we worry about has been a, a key element. And so I am using something that would make a computer software at a pharmacy blow up because uh, their computer software is geared for asthma, another inflammatory disease. And so with asthma, it's acceptable and the insurance companies will approve 0 0.5 milligrams twice a day in a nebulizer or one milligram once a day. But here is what I have found. And it really was strange to my ears when I was told this when it first came out as Pulmacord, that this, is a, this medication, an inhaled budesonide, is not given by weight. It's given by disease severity. It's given by disease severity. So you'll have a creamy in the ICU 25 years ago Give, and they'll receive one milligram respule. And you'll have adults that are 320 pound men that might be uh, with asthma that might be on 0.5 milligrams once or twice a day. And so it depends on the disease severity and both asthma and COVID are inflammatory respiratory diseases, but COVID is super inflammatory, multitudes of one. And so I'm using one milligram every two hours when people have severe symptoms as, as a targeted dose, and I'm not seeing the potential, uh, the feared uh, side effects. Got it. So I uh, thank you very much for this. I wanted to address a comment I'm seeing here uh, by Timothy. So Timothy, uh, I understand that, so he, I feel like he's a physician as well. And the comment is that it is possible that the discussion that we're doing, this is not as the, the budesonide does not work as effectively. I want to uh, remind to all of our viewers, the stages of this disease in the beginning in the respiratory system, then getting out of the, then aggravating the respiratory system, then getting out of the respiratory system, going into the cardiovascular system, renal system, GIT system, then the viral load itself becomes really nothing and the immune system dysregulation starts. And so um, it, it would really depend upon what is the stage of the patient's disease. For example, if a patient is on um, uh, ventilators, at that time, inhaled budesonide may be useful to see the inflammation within the lungs, but now the, the heart is getting damaged, 
the vessels are getting damaged, the kidneys are getting damaged, and maybe dexamethasone or methylprednisolone or some other forms may be more useful. Maybe at the same time, we may need focal immune suppressions as well, for example, lironlimab or, or remdesivir or others. So my uh, point here is it is not one thing that would work for all stages, but if we can agree on one uh, aspect of how to manage this disease, and that is early on be aggressive. Don't let the patient end up in a situation where they are so sick that now these things will not work. Then we have a problem. So the, the flip side of the whole management uh, situation is in the beginning, we were told don't manage in the beginning other than giving sympt uh, symptomatic treatments. And what is emerging, the evidence that is emerging is be aggressive in the beginning so that you don't have to go to the later stages. So that is how I would uh, address that. Dr. Bartlett, if you have a few more minutes, I know it is late. You are in, in the central time. If I'm not going to speak to you, sir. few more minutes. I have some uh, questions here that we had on uh, Twitter. And then there are some questions here as well uh, as I'm seeing the live uh, chat here. So are you uh, OK if I ask some of the questions that Cool Beans have been asking? Uh, I would be honored to answer Cool Bean questions. Awesome. So I'm going to go to Twitter. And then, um, so here I had I had tweeted this yesterday that you will be with us. So then there are many, many questions. Many of those have a similar category. So for example, here is a question, corticosteroids when inhaled in keys chance of secondary infections, what antibiotics he prefers with budesonide, sorry. Yeah, that's a good question. And mm -hmm. so that was my concern because we know you know, uh, in the 1800s, the, the, the number one killer uh, in the United States was pneumonia. Hmm. Uh, and so uh, what a game changer it was to have antibiotics. And we know that any viral pneumonia can lead to a secondary bacterial pneumonia. So what I have chosen is clarithromycin. Uh, others are using azithromycin and doxycycline. Uh, there's, uh, you have to work around the patient and treat the individual. They may be allergic to something. But I chose clarithromycin because I, I learned something when it came out as a brand medicine. It covers, at that time, it covered 86% of strep pneumo. Azithromycin covered 78%. I like 86% coverage better. I like my patients to get better the first time. And so uh, there's lots of options. Uh, we're talking about empirically, proactively, preventively, uh, 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 using strategies to protect from secondary bacterial pneumonia. Of course, if someone needs to be hospitalized and re receive IV antibiotics, of course, we want to do whatever is appropriate. Uh, but budesonide is definitely a tool in, in our fight against COVID that needs to be considered. Got it. So then the next question by Rajul, the same person, um, and he's a good friend. Uh, the question is, if budesonide is not available, is there any alternative corticosteroids which can be inhaled to give similar effect? So I actually was speaking to a neonatologist up in Minnesota about a newborn. The mother had symptoms when she was in labor and she tested positive. The baby tested positive when they checked the baby. The baby is still in the ICU. I spoke with her about budesonide. And she's a younger uh, physician. She has not. She was not that familiar with inhaled budesonide, and so uh, at first she was resistant to give that. But the patient, uh, the little baby, was having worsening symptoms in the NICU, so that she chose to use a different inhaled steroid, the one that actually has evidence of increasing the risk of secondary bacterial pneumonia three times. Uh, but that child is improving, and so you know whatever works. Uh, is the right answer, but targeted treatment. We're talking about a respiratory inflammatory virus. And so we want to use a respiratory anti-inflammatory solution. You don't, we want to avoid the risk of systemic steroids, but the other one is out there. I just don't want to discredit anything uh, because it can have its place. 
makes sense. Makes sense. So thank you very much for this as well. I think that we have already sort of touched upon this question, Rob, from Florida, USA. Based on what research did he initially come up with the idea of using nebulizer steroids and treatment for a virus? So I think you you mentioned that in the beginning as well. So uh, I think we've gotten the answer to that. At the beginning of the patient, so there is Daniel says, at the beginning of the pandemic, ER were using albuterol and budesonide. Has he spoken with any other pulmonologists who may have used it? So have you talked with other doctors who have been using? Well, I'll tell you about an interesting conversation I had uh, 30 minutes before I got here. Hmm. A U.S. congressman that's uh, fighting COVID. And uh, what the, uh, uh, the capital physician uh, is treating him with. Hmm. Guess what it is? Hmm. It's inhaled budesonide. And, right. and he chose to give azithromycin. And, uh, the, and, and the congressman uh, is getting better. Uh, so uh, they were using it as a twice, uh, twice a day regimen, which was my original strategy. And then to my horror, that patient used it more frequently than that okay. and uh, got better quicker. And so my now strategy is to escalate the dose according to the severity of the illness. And when the symptoms subside, then you decrease your dosing. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much. Next question is an uh, interesting one. We kind of touched upon it as well before, but if you like, you can comment on it. How does suppress suppressing an immune response with steroids in the early stage make sense, the viral replication stage? Well, that's a good question. We don't want to suppress the immune system, but the immune system is actually very complex, as everyone knows. And uh, we're, we're actually having uh, uh, the evidence is there. Uh, hundreds of patients, uh, we're, we passed 400 patients a long time ago with zero mortality, uh, with patients recovering quickly, some of them telling me during the treatment they, they get released the first dose. Um, and so what we're seeing is that, and there's research out there for 25 years, and the Cool Beans are brilliant people, they can do the research, but I gave them a good head start when they look at the paper, uh, that budesonide doesn't increase the risk of secondary bacterial pneumonia uh, like another inhaled steroid does three times. We're talking about the other one probably because it has a longer half-life. It probably is uh, having a greater residual effect that's, that's down-regulating the immune system in the lungs. But I'm not finding that with budesonide. And that's why the capital physician is treating our U.S. congressman with it. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much. This is uh, once again, excellent. Uh, the, the next question here from Arun, I'm actually going to lump it in the same uh, discussion that is it an late stage uh, therapy or an early stage? So I think that started from the late stage, then people have done it early stage as well. Is, is that the correct summary of uh, my understanding? Yeah. Yes, uh, you have said it brilliantly that we should try early treatment, uh, that we have found that they were wrong when they said don't use corticosteroids against COVID. And now we have found that there are early treatment strategies and it makes a difference to treat early. And that was my focus. Uh, but uh, we have found that uh, it can be used in the ICU and still patients recover and come home. I know of cases in, uh, a case in uh, South Texas where the patient was treated in the ICU and is home now. I know of a case in, in California that was uh, treated uh, and uh, in the hospital, in the ICU, in his home now. So it works in late stage as well. It's just a tool um, in a fight against a super inflammatory disease. And so uh, it just happens to be much more effective than any of us would have guessed. So uh, while I'm scrolling through the questions here, there is a question on the live feed, and that is about the hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin. Have you had the experience of using them as well, or you, your protocol has been mainly towards the budesonide? So I have focused on using the budesonide as my strategy. And I, in Texas, we have a unique situation. Mm -hmm. um, we had the pharmacy board sent a letter to all the pharmacies on the weekend telling them, uh, do not fill a script for hydroxychloroquine uh, unless you get a written prescription uh, with a diagnosis on the script. Uh, and we have never been in that situation before with any disease, with any medicine in Texas. It was very peculiar. Um, and it, it really 
uh, made the pharmacists very defensive, uh, made the doctors very defensive. Um, and uh, that was the atmosphere when I started treating COVID. Hmm. And I have something else that was a strategy that I stumbled upon, the budesonide, which is FDA approved to decrease inflammation in the lungs. Hmm. It's been out for since 73. It was patented. It has such a, a, an excellent safety profile that um, I'm just, I've just had such success with it that I haven't uh, really uh, dared to go into those waters. But I'll tell you, I had, I had the honor of meeting a brilliant man, uh, Dr. Zelenko, during that uh, 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 Zoom meeting for, four, for about an hour. And while we were talking, he holds up a box of budesonide and he says, Doctor, I'm using your medicine myself. This is the father of hydroxychloroquine and zinc, and he is a brilliant man. Hmm. And, uh, I don't want to detract. There are uh, doctors that are uh, doing whatever means it takes, taking off their belt and using it as a tourniquet, in other words. They're doing whatever they can to save their patients' lives, and I respect that, and they're having great success. I know of a doctor, I've heard of a Dr. Tran associated with UCLA using Medrol dose packs. I know of doctors using Medrol dose packs across the nation right now in early disease. Hmm. It works for many people. It is systemic. Uh, I am uh, thankful that people are being saved from being in the hospital in the ICU on a ventilator and dying. But, Absolutely. but it, you know, for diabetes, it could raise the sugar. So budesonide, uh, there are doctors that are using combinations now hmm. of hydroxychloroquine and budesonide or Medrol dose packs and budesonide. It's a tool. I didn't invent it. I am just thankful that I found something we could use when they said there's nothing you can do. Correct. And I wanted to then add this comment in here that uh, viewers, as, as usual, this is not a prescription for a, any single person. This is an educational discussion. This is a discussion of what Dr. Bartlett has been doing. This is not prescription for anyone. Please do not self-prescribe. Do not get in trouble. The blood sugar levels need to be seen. Comorbidities need to be seen. Any immunosuppressions have to be seen before. Any infections have to be seen before. So these things, these drugs, if you started taking without care, these in some cases can become fatal. So this, these are not prescriptions. These are educational discussions. And please use them for that. Uh, continuing on with our questions, um, there is a very interesting question by, from Danielle. She says, what about using albuterol 15 minutes before administering the budesonide to open the airways? So is there a need to do that or maybe as for asthmatics or for everyone? Oh, that, that's an excellent question. Albuterol is great for asthma. I have found that it is totally ineffective with COVID. And um, I've had patients that were prescribed the albuterol inhaler. They've been given it as nebulizer treatments. It has no effect. Uh, it does not affect COVID at all. But it does work with asthma. And so, um, but the budesonide is a profound effect. And um, so I'm not against having albuterol available if someone has asthma. And actually, uh, interestingly, I, am, I have a patient recovering that is currently tested positive for the flu, which is H1N1 right now, and COVID, and mm -hmm. has asthma. Mm -hmm. And that patient is not having trouble with uh, the uh, bronchospasm that person is having the classic signs and symptoms of the COVID disease and is recovering with my pre treatment protocol. Without the, the albuterol is totally appropriate for asthma, uh, for, uh, for a rescue uh, medicine. But this person that has asthma and the H1N1 flu that's going around this year and COVID is recovering. And so that was quite that, that was one that made me gulp. That was one that made me really nervous. And that person didn't go to the hospital, didn't go to the ICU, and actually turned and improved radically with this treatment strategy. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much for, for that answer. Um, continuing on, there is a question which is, so there is a, a question, I think somebody is, uh, some levity here. They're saying, where can we find doctors who would give us budesonide? So if I have a problem, where do I go? Any uh, any comment on that? Well, uh, you know, again, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. There are doctors that have found uh, that uh, they've had some experience with the budesonide helping. And so on our website, 
we have uh, we have uh, a tab called providers. And so people can go to that and they'll be able to find doctors in different states that are using my protocol. They've, they've talked about using my protocol and they said they would be glad to have their name listed for any uh, patients that are interested in a telemedicine visit. And then they will take it case by case appropriately and treat the patient as an individual. But uh, these are providers that seem to have a great grasp of what's going on right now and are having tremendous success. And if any of your uh, cool beans are doctors who, after they've studied this and did their search on the internet of all the research that's out there, and they're interested in being listed on this website, I would be honored to uh, add them to the list. I'm not interested in being everyone's doctor. I am interested in uh, just spreading some useful information that I've stumbled across. Awesome. Thank you very much. So there are a couple of more questions that are on, on a similar uh, vein, and these are, can the budesonide, when it is being used, can the supplements and others, I think, vitamin D, vitamin C, can they continue or they, these need to be stopped? Any contraindications? I have not found contraindications. Hmm. Um, I'm not a, a natural a naturalologist or whatever. Uh, naturopathic or doctor. I'm, I'm an MD. And so my training and my 28 years of experience has been with uh, FDA approved medications, uh, tried and true things that are, are medical. That doesn't mean that uh, other things can't help. I do prescribe zinc because I know that does interfere with virus replication and that's over the counter. And, and I do uh, at this point, I feel very strongly that if someone tests positive and the rest of the family is worried about getting sick in the house because they can't leave, uh, that mouthwash uh, is a powerful, over-the-counter, common sense strategy for them and for the family members because it starts in the upper airway and then progresses down to the lower airway. And so there are some common sense things that can be used that are not medical, but uh, I am not an expert on all the supplements and I wouldn't uh, venture there. I'll just give my information that I'm familiar with. Awesome. Dr. Bartlett, this was such a wonderful talk. And uh, out of all of the talks, we have about 110, 12 lectures so far. A few of the lectures, I would say hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin supplements, and this talk are, I believe, the key talks that can enable the world to make sure that less patient misery occurs, less deaths occur. And then in an inexpensive way, we can manage our patients early on and get rid of this whole mess that we are in. And uh, I'm saying that in a very uh, in a very humble way, very respectfully, people who are in ICUs, our heart goes out to them. They are stuck in that state and uh, I wish and pray that they become okay. But doctors should be allowed to and they should think about taking care of the situation early on. And so this is a very key talk that you delivered today. Thank you very much for this. I'm honored to be here with you and the Cool Beans. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So for the Cool Beans, tomorrow is my off. I think that it's a wonderful discussion that we had today. This is a bonus. This is a gift. Dr. Bartlett, thank you very much for your time. And Cool Beans, I would see you on Monday. Thank you very much.